Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Hudson. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us, biggest firm outside of Boston. Um, I do nothing but elder law, and everybody else there does something else. This show is not about elder law, though, as for those of you who have watched before. It's about my friends Frank and Mary um, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and as you know, Frank and Mary's goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if they're in Hudson, they want to stay in Hudson. They don't want to move to Seattle. They don't even want to move to Marlboro. So the question is, who are the people you need to know? And what are the programs you need to know about if you're Frank and Mary and you want to live in your house until you die? So to really help me figure that out, I found a terrific co-host, my friend Jackie Kapopoulos, who was actually at Marlboro Hospital for years and years um, and is now retired and is chair of the Friends of the, of the Hudson Seniors, right? And as a matter of fact, we've got this great guest today who is a Marlboro Hospital guy. Now, you, you may think that he's an insurance guy for the many, many people who know Michael Murphy from the Murphy Insurance. And by the way, I always tell people, you know, for folks in Mall, in, here in Hudson, I'm not even Arthur Bergeron, I'm just Patty Murphy's husband, because I married one of, one of uh, Michael's uh, aunts, one of Dennis Murphy's sisters. Um, and, and we're gonna talk today about Marlboro Hospital. And, I, and Jackie was like, should I come? I said, well, Jackie, you're a person from Marlboro Hospital. You know, these are your issues, right? So I'm gonna start off by saying what I have said to other people that for many years I was on the board at, at Marlboro Hospital and I would always tell people when, after, when I, after I left, I, I, I left there, that um, the greatest thing I ever did on the board was to convince Michael Murphy to join the board, which was now a number of That years was the ago. greatest thing you did? That was the greatest <laughs> thing I did. And now, my, and Michael has now been the chairman of the board now since... Since 2018. Since 2018. And so I just figured we'd just talk about the hospital. Okay, right? Because the right. hospital's been there just, well, so, I mean, I was born there. I don't know if you were born, right? But you were there for a long time. I was born at Marlboro Hospital. You were born at Marlboro mm -hmm. Hospital, right? I, I was I was Cambridge girl. Oh, I came to Hudson city. 51 you're, years ago. Oh, you're new. You're still new. You're still new. So, Michael, just, 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 just talk about, if you could, you know, kind of what your experience has been at, at Marlboro Hospital, why you got involved in the first place, why you wanted to become chairman, a merciless... Right, thankless job, except for the pay. The pay, which is tremendous, right? Yeah, the pay is great. It's really it's great. Zero. Right, right, right. You know, but so they could triple your salary at any time. And exactly. You'd still be there, right? Um, and then, and, and I'd like to, you know, the, the pay is actually just to jump into your to, yeah. to answer. The pay is actually the reward is um, you can't measure it because it is such a big part of our community, and I truly mean that. I think having a vibrant community hospital is really a treasure that communities that don't have it probably recognize what they don't have. Those who right. do may not always appreciate what they have. You don't know. And we are blessed because we have a tremendous community hospital. And really the community hospital is made up of people that have been there forever, that have dedicated their lives. Right, and, and I, I know when I talk to folks who are doing their estate planning, and I say, you know, if you're thinking about charities, who are you giving money to, right? If you really want to be taking care of your kids and your grandkids and stuff, right? You want to make sure that if they're around here, that, that they, they can go to the hospital, right? Absolutely. You, need a, a, you know, a place without a hospital is just not the same thing. Nobody wants to die in traffic on the way to the someplace, right? And again, that may be the greatest reward I get is the fact that, you know, that's kind of one of those legacy things in life that when you kind of towards the end, when you're saying, okay, let me take stock of my life, leaving something behind like a good solid community hospital, uh, th I don't think there's any reward for that. I mean, that, that is just right. tremendous. Right, that's really special. So just talk about, you know, what, what you know, you, if you kind of were talking about why you decided to do it, right? Talk about, you know, kind of what, why you decided to become, to, to, or to be willing to be the chair, right? So that's, that's a stretch. And then kind of what the hospital's doing now, sure. where you think it's going. And of course, especially to my friends who are often Frank and Mary's age or older, sure. right? and by the way, one of them is me, so I'm going to be turning 70. That's a breathtaking thought in uh, in uh, January. You know, and I know. You're a child. So I, I know. <laughs> My dad would always say, oh, to be 80 again, he would say. I told it to a client the other day. He said, oh, to be 90 again. And I just talked to a lady at the senior center who was 100. Yeah, that's great. Top of her game. That's just great. on the top of her game. I won't mention her name, right? But that's there aren't that many. 
topic for you. So anyway, just going to talk about. So what's things. interesting is you had you mentioned my family, but um, so my maternal grandfather was actually on the board. So I, I kind of joke and say that I'm a legacy board member. You're really? You're really um, sorry, yeah, that? and I think he had Mr. tremendous satisfaction. Pope, Pope, correct. He had tremendous satisfaction in being part of the community. My grandfather, like a lot of people, you know, we're not alone, um, felt this was his community and he needed to find a way to give back. And that's what I feel. And I'll be honest, it's not me alone. Um, we have tremendous board members, but we also have a great volunteer group, people that go in maybe once a week, maybe three times a week, maybe seven times a week. And the hospital really wouldn't function without those volunteers. I mean, we have a great staff, but it's really the volunteers that really kind of form the backbone of the hospital in a lot of ways. Um, they give it the kind of the feel. The yeah, they sure do. And, and what's nice the about, the correct. Yeah. And what's nice about Marlboro Hospital is even though it has a community feel, it's affiliated with one of the largest, mm -hmm. one of the most prestigious teaching hospitals in the world. UMass, and I think that sometimes we don't always understand that or appreciate that. And as you remember, you were part of the board. We do a process called credentialing in which we um, provide privileges to doctors that um, may come in once a month, may come in every day. And these are some of the best doctors in the world. And so we can't just look through the lens of, well, it's a community hospital. It's more than a community hospital in the sense that it's got tremendously skilled people that have the skill set of any big city hospital around. Which is pretty, and I suppose, Jackie, you would have seen the whole thing because you would have been a nurse there even kind of before they were part oh, of that I, system. I was, I was a nurse there before we were ever a part of that system. I was a nurse there way back in the 60s, the late 60s, um, where I just did part-time work. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they had three med surge floors at that time. Sure. And um, there was no outpatient. There was pediatrics and there was maternity. So uh -huh. I go, I go way back. Um, and then um, gradually, you saw um, some of the floors, the pediatrics moved away, but. Um, uh, but then it it got really. Um, involved in, uh, then they went into a special care, when special care sure. was mm -hmm. really relatively new. Sure. Um, and so there was the special care unit. And then from the special care unit, a few la uh, years later, they, when um, the push was on to have discrete, discrete um, psychiatric units within general hospitals to cut down on the admissions to the state right. hospital. Yep. Sure. And to keep people from being so institutionalized for right. long periods of time. Oh, so that's how that started. That's that, how that started, yes. Granger 3. Yeah. Uh, um, Granger 3. And then that's where I worked for 30 years, right sure. from the beginning. And then after that, um, within two to three years, they had the um, alcohol unit, the MARCAP unit. And that was a discrete alcohol unit. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there, then... Um, People who had alcohol problems, who would detox, they, that's where they went. People who had psychiatric problems um, came to our unit, and if they needed to be detoxed, we could detox them. And from there, it went from inpatient to forming outpatient programs right, right, for psych huge, patients, yeah, right. for alcohol patients. And then from there, um, the affiliation with UMass Medical, and then from there we've got a state-of-the-art um, uh, cancer treatment center. Right, that radiation. You know, I mean, I, I mean, right. it's 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 it's, it's, um, it's just amazing what I've seen sure. develop over the years. Sure. And I was, you know, I mean, I was really lucky enough to be there, and I loved what I did. Sure, um, that's I, great. I really loved, and I did different aspects of things. I was an ER screener. I worked on the unit. I was a nurse manager for a while. And I did outpatient for a while. And I, I mean, I just really yeah, had a wonderful great. career there. Now, now did, did, did you notice a, 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 a change when, you, when we became part of UMass, when Marlboro Hospital became part of UMass? Well, we, you know, we, yes, of course, of course you did. Um, 
um, we started affiliating more. We got um, students from UMass who came to the psych unit. Right. We had to go to a computer system not long down the road. Right. So there were changes that were, you know, in, in some ways difficult and in some ways um, were, were really welcome, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. especially the um, uh, having that influence of UMass come sure. in the... Um, because that's kind of the yeah. blessing, now, yeah. you know, that you yeah. have this one. I, I think one of the things that's been great, and I'm sure there was a concern about it when they took over, was, was would you be able to keep that kind of community feel to the hospital, mm -hmm. which I think it's always been able to maintain, oh. while at the same yeah. time having just, you know, this kind of staffing and resources and st stuff that way beyond what most community hospitals could possibly do, because they just don't have those affiliations. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. I think that's really the key, and I, I agree with Jackie that, you know, um, from the positive standpoint, it provided resources that we just couldn't generate internally. Uh, you talked about the state-of-the-art cancer pavilion, mm -hmm. for example, which is a wonderful resource. And um, but those are very expensive to build. Mm -hmm. And so, without the resources of the parent, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Mm -hmm. And right. so, we get the best of all worlds, to be honest. Right. We you get never that. been able to fund your fundraise your way locally into that facility. Correct. Right. So yeah. it was really a matter of some folks from UMass being able to write a big check. Right. 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 Exactly. And that's really the key is the scale. Right. You know, it's a, it's a, it's mm -hmm. an industry that unfortunately scale matters. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and but I also well, I remember and I don't know if this is still the case that you now end up ha having a lot of the operations floors, right? A lot of the a lot of the operating suites being occupied by folks who are actually exporting to here, who want to have the operations done here, as opposed to doing the operations. It's another great benefit. I mean, right. we have the resources to be able to bring in physicians from all over who are credentialed and have privileges at the hospital. And you know, clearly, you know, having that outpatient surgery is very important. You right. know, and so um, you know, you don't have to go to Boston. You don't have to go to Worcester and fight traffic. You go to Marlboro and there's plenty of parking and you've got the same degree as, you know, you've got the Jackies of today's generation. Right. People that are going to take great care of you, the care, that are passionate about what they do. Right. Mm -hmm. And like it, and like being at a hospital of this scale. So they kind of consciously decided they don't want to be in a gigantic, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And for Frank and Mary, it's fabulous because they're in their community. Um, they can have friends come and visit them. If one of them is in the hospital, they can easily get there and, and visit one another. Right. They'll have um, resources right within the community to take care of them when they go home. So I think, you know, so much of the um, planning now is really geared towards the geriatric patient. The geriatric patient has to be the biggest population. I mean, there are hip surgeries with younger oldsters mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and knee surgeries and, and things like that. But, um, but the major population, I think, is, is getting older and older. People are living longer. Right. And community right. hospitals, I think, really um, provide a comfort and so they don't you, feel like they get Yeah, so, so, and, I, and I absolutely agree. I think that's, yeah. that is absolutely correct. I'll expand it a little bit. I think that the community hospitals are geared towards, you know, the, the health care model has shifted. You know, it's always been important to provide great clinical care. That's always been an important thing. But the industry, and I, and I know that people like Jackie provided great personal care, but the industry is really understanding that it's also about patient satisfaction. It's about how did the patient feel about the services? How did the patient feel when they came in? And I think that's one of the areas that a community hospital can do a good job with, is the fact that it is very personal. It is, you get to know your staff. You get to know the people that are taking care of you. In some cases, whether this is good or bad, they might be your neighbor. You know, someone <laughs> right. that is, that could be is you know, very right. compassionate towards you. But I think they're all compassionate. I really, too, it, it, the admiration I have for people that like Jackie, I mean, it's not an easy job. But I'll tell you, the work that they do, it's incredible. Okay, it so really you is. You don't become a nurse because you don't like people. Correct. Right. 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 There's right. a filter. There. It's a calling. Like, it is truly a calling. It is a, it's a very special group of people. It is truly a calling. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that, you know, um, 
there are so many specialties now. No so that people can put them in places where they feel like they, they do their best. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the med surge nurses who don't mind the IVs and all the tubes and changing IVs and things like that. They don't mind the machines. Same with special care. There are people like me who love... You even start love, describing that. Love, I start love, going, love, getting, love you know, the oh, psych. I got, I'm a little dizzy. Right? You know, right. I mean, <laughs> that, that, and I've had nurses say, I don't know how you can do that. And I say, there's something for everyone. Right, that's correct. You correct. know, yeah. and um, that's a good thing about nursing. You can, you can pick what you want to do. Right. Right, yeah. right. So as you're seeing this evolving, Michael, you know, you know what, what has changed even since you've been there and, and, and how are you seeing it changing into the future? Especially as it would affect folks, folks seven sure. years over. Sure, sure. So, so I think that the focus on patient satisfaction is certainly something mm -hmm. that has always been there. I would never suggest that it hasn't, but we're really keenly measuring it on a number of different metrics. I think that healthcare, like every industry, evolves. I think that you know we're seeing uh, the use of telemedicine, which is a very positive, especially as you get older. Where um, over time, you know, if you're not feeling well, the doctor may be able to diagnose you through an iPhone by just you know face to face talking to you through you know Skype or something like that, FaceTime, and I think that's wonderful because the goal is. Um, to kind of keep people out of the hospital. Not yeah. so that they can't see people like Jackie, but you know, no. we yeah. want to make sure that people, a healthcare system is a very complex system with a lot of moving parts. Uh, you, it, it's, it would be impossible to oversimplify it. But we want to make sure that the best healing environment is for people at home. There's a number of you know, studies that suggest that. And so, you know, there's a number of things in place. But if you need to go to a hospital, we have a wonderful hospital here, a community hospital, that has kind of that feeling of home. You know, the challenges around that are that, um, you know, it would be great if everybody had their own room. It's not like going on vacation. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a little different. You know, if you go on vacation, you don't open up the room and say, oh, great, the Bergeron family is here. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll put a divider we'll up. Divide and, you know, it. this is what we like to watch. You watch this. Yeah. No, so it's, it, 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 you know, I, I think that when we try to oversimplify and try to make it sound like it's, it's like hospitality, it really isn't. But I think they do a great job of understanding that. And there are limitations to what a physical plant can do and so we try to we try to manage through that by making it the best possible outcome that people can have work on food services work on keeping the hospital quiet at night as you remember that was one of the primary things that we track and we still track that and it's a big um, deal. It's just a it big is a deal. it is it's believe it or not yeah. and I'm sure Jackie could talk more about it than you or I could but a, a healing environment is a quiet environment. Right. If you're not, because you're not there because you've been having a great day. <laughs> right. You know, it's like we always talked about, we, um, uh, to, to, in some ways, uh, you know, a, a hospital is a hotel for sick people. Right. Right. So you want all of those amenities, right? But you really want those amenities because you right. really don't feel great. Right. And, exactly. and, and the notion of, you know, waking up with beeps and things in the middle right. of the night is just tough. Right. It's just tough. Right. I was, um, I was hospitalized up at UMass. Okay. Um, because they were unable to do the surgery that I needed on that particular day mm -hmm. at Marlboro. But um, they gave me earplugs at right. night, you know. Right. So, I mean, I think that, and, um, and a mask, it was a kit. Right. So you had the mask and you had the earplugs. So that, you know, it so, really... And I think that's evolved over time. We do yeah. the same thing in Marlboro where, yeah. you know, we're trying to listen to the voice of the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I tell people... My principal job as a board member, forget the fact that I'm chair, my principal job is I am the voice of the next person who walks through the front door. Yeah. That's all I am. I'm not a clinician. I can't solve anybody's medical needs, but I will provide that voice to the professionals to say, why do we do this? Does this make sense? And I have to say that they're very open to that. And that's all we can do is we can do more than that in the sense of, you know, providing some, you know, background in terms of maybe financial acumen and things of that nature. But it's really that voice. It's that next person who walks through the front door should feel like they have a voice to people saying, why do we do this? Why can't we do this? Well, how do we make the experience better? And I think there's an example right there of how we tried to make the experience better. Right. Right, because it's like a little, it's a million little things. 
Exactly it's a correct. Little things. Yep. And, and would you would you anticipate that in the long run, therefore, the relationship with UMass is just is, that's that's permanent. That's here. To, oh, for right? sure. Right. For sure. And I think there's a lot of positives there. Yes. You know, and I think that as, um, as it is sometimes. I remember from the board level. To sure. Saying, well, we're really having to deal with this big mothership that's out there, you know, and but. But I think they understand and recognize and value community hospitals. Now, um, we want to make sure that we properly utilize resources. And so there might be some consolidation. You saw that with Clinton and Health Alliance. Um, but I can tell you right now, I don't anticipate that. In fact, not in my lifetime will Marlboro Hospital see that. Because I think there's too great an opportunity to leverage the community aspect of healthcare. And I think that UMass certainly recognizes that. You know, now there might be tweaks along the way, but I can assure you that they're gonna to continue to invest in that facility. Whether they invest in building or telemedicine or some other thing, they're gonna to invest to make sure that this population is properly addressed through healthcare. Now, now this is, it's related to this, but a little bit unrelated. I, I know one of the things that I, I had talked to you about was kind of my personal interest in dealing with this whole issue of people looking at the last year of their lives, you know, and looking at, among other things, where they're going to be for the last year of their lives. Because it, it, the, the, the statistic that I read was 80% of people want to die at home, 20% of people die at home. Most right. people die, in, in home being defined as your house or an assisted living, right? It's your home, right? Mm -hmm. Most people die in a nursing home or a hospital, right? Can you just kind of talk about the, the, you know, the, the folks who are here, the, the, the issues from the hospital's perspective that you face around folks who are here and, and die? Yeah, so I think there's been a fundamental shift in how healthcare kind of looks at that at kind of end of life. You know, and I know that a number of years ago when healthcare was kind of a nationally debated topic, everybody kind of looked at what we call palliative care. And there was a mis fundamental misunderstanding. They thought of these, you know, death panels death and things panel. of that. And, really and it bad? was just, oh, God. I think it was, it, was, it was just a fundamental misunderstanding. And by the way, can you just define palliative care broadly? <clears throat> palliative care is basically how do we provide the best health care for those remaining years? How do we, it's a quality of life issue is what it boils down to. Right. It's, it's defining with the patient and their family, what does the end of your life look like in terms of quality? Right. It's you the, know? the point at which you're, we're no longer saying, we're doing all of these things in order to cure you, to bring you back to this other What do you want? State. Because you may right. be in a position where it, at the end, you may not be able to find what you want. And so, you know, one of the things that healthcare has been mandated to do, but I think they've embraced it, is um, what they call the patient family advisory committee, which is one of the critical committees on our, in the overall board. Yeah. And we have two wonderful people that, we have a current board member who is the prior chair, gentleman by the name of Bill Fisher. Mm -hmm. And then we have another gentleman who's ex officio because of his position on the PFAC. Um, the PFAC. Yeah, PFAC. <laughs> Yeah, and the family patient care, it, it, is, it is a voice for those families. You know, and Ho Howard Ferris runs a, does a very good job, and it provides that voice. How do people want to be treated? And I think healthcare, the, the clinicians that I know, and I think others, the discussion that they have is, you know, let's have, a, it's all about communication. Let's have a dialogue around what does this look like? You know, what do you as a family member want for your loved one? And I think right. healthcare has really understood that. I think that, you know, and I certainly wouldn't say that in the past they didn't look at it that way, but I think it's become much of a bigger part of the conversation. And I suppose that, that kind of conversation occurs, once again, especially in community hospital settings. Correct. People aren't coming here for the great, not necessarily, you know, you're, this isn't the cancer center, you know, this isn't the, the you know, the specialized, right? You're, you're coming here to live your life. And right. so the, 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 the interesting challenge is to be, how can, you, how can you try to make every day as good as it can be correct. while you're here? And that's the goal, correct. Right. And so are there folks on staff that deal, in, in Marlboro that deal with those issues? So they have gone into a hospice type model mm -hmm. um, in which... Um, what does that mean? What does that mean? Because well, we know that, we know, t for, for, those sure. the, for the uninitiate, which mm -hmm. I think was included me for, you know, for a long time, I hear the word hospice. 
and I think of a building, you know, as kind of a separate building sure. where you would be going to f spend the very last days of your life, you know. And it, is only, it was only from kind of being involved in those stuff that I realized that those, that, that is a tiny, tiny percentage mm -hmm. of what hospice deals with, both in terms of separate structures and in terms of how much time they're talking about. Right, and now I, I, you know, I find myself talking about encouraging people to talk about hospice. From the moment that they that they have decided that the, that whatever they have, they're not, you know, trying to get to a cure, that instead they're trying to live every day, and that right. could be a year, that could be a long time that that happens. Yeah, and I think that's the challenge around it because yeah. the t the timing, in, unfortunately, in some cases, is known and obvious. Right. Um, but the model is designed to really have that conversation around, okay, what does this look like? And dying with dignity, basically. And I think that the healthcare system in the past wasn't geared for that. They're becoming much more focused and geared towards that. And so I think that you're gonna see an evolution in hospitals, not being a place to go to die, but a place that can, can accommodate in a very dignified manner if a person is, you know, they're going to die. Living their last years. Right. You know, one of the things. Or living their last days. And, mm -hmm. and as they talk With to dignity people, and know, respect. They, people talk to me about, you know, I, I, you know I'm going to spend forever dying. And I go, trust me, dying, I can tell you how long dying takes. Dying takes one second. Here now, gone now, right? That's dying. The only que the question is always how are you living, right? How are you living? How are you living during that during that? And and and, and once again, I go back to this bizarre statistic that I that kind of helped me understand what I felt, uh, you know, kind of anecdotally, that you know back when we were kids. No, this is not you. You're back when we were kids. People would just die. They would you know have a heart attack and you would die, and you'd have a stroke and you would die. That's right. Up, right? And I remember, and now it doesn't seem to happen. And right. I finally saw a statistic. I saw this number um, um, that, that in 1970, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your likelihood of being dead within two weeks was 33%. Sure. Now it's 3%. Right. That's the change. Right. So, so people do, it's, I mean, it's a mixed blessing, but people do now most likely know that death may be on the horizon not like imminent, but on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, if, if they can hide from that, right? But instead they may want to embrace that and say, so this is, I had a partner, a wonderful partner. Uh, my interest in this in, in many ways, it kind of is all from him, for the, my friend David Gabois, who had it, got it, you know, was totally healthy and then went into the, talked to his doctor as he had a pain in his stomach and the doctor said, oh, you should go, you know, get this checked. And he goes to the hospital and the doctor let's open him up and they say, well, you know, the, the good news is it's slow growing. And so you've got six to 12 months. The bad news is it's slow growing. So it's everywhere and there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. And he embraced it. He just embraced it. He said, you know, he put up, went, went home his, his, with his wife and they, he put up a sign in the bedroom, no tears. And he said, I'm going to live every day of my life. Right. And in some ways, this a is a blessing motto, though, because I'm not because I'm not, you know, God has told me that I've got a finite amount of time. Right. And and he he lived every day. He was fishing five days before he died. He was fishing out in the wilderness five days before he died. And he told his doctors, I'll take chemo as long as it doesn't make me nauseous. I'm happy to try to slow it down, but I'm not going to sacrifice. Right. The quality of his day. life. Right. Yeah. So to have doctors and a hospital that is wanting to be helping you figure that out, you know? Yeah. I was just gonna make one more point, because I know we're, but yeah. one of the other things that they're doing, and I think, you know, Jackie can comment on this, is they're, they're teaching clinicians that it's okay to have a conversation with the family. And I think that that's a difficult conversation one for minute. anybody. Right. But when you're taught how to do it, and, I, and it sounds kind of crazy, right? You're gonna, but it is a learned skill. And I think, skill. in fairness, I mean, I can't. I mean, Jackie certainly can comment yeah. on that. That's a difficult yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I've I've had those conversations sure. with people, and all people are different. Some people can look at life and say, someday my day is going to come. Um, other people are so fearful. Right. And really, I mean, just so fearful. And then, you know, you really have to work at 
allaying their fears and right. um, and letting them know that you know it it will be um, that they'll be taken care of right. that they'll be made comfortable. My brother died of lung cancer, and he said to me, "Do you think I'm going to die today?" This is when the last mm -hmm. week or two, and I said. I don't know, Jerry, but you're here right now, so let's just, you know, right. go with that. And there were days that I said to him, no, I don't think it's going to be today. You know, I mean, it just right. depended. Right. But, um, but there's the honesty with compassion and in reinforcing that you're going to be okay. Right. And the notion of having that as part of the culture of the hospital. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the, it's a real community gift. That's a real and I think people forget to realize that it's as, as difficult to people like Jackie. It may not be her family member, she just talked about her brother, but the toll on the people in the hospital, we can't underestimate either. And so that's the learned skill set, because that's, that's a system. very difficult situation right. to be in. Mm -hmm. And learning to take care of each other at the hospital. Correct. Right, just to kind of brace yourself. Yeah. Th these are really important topics. I really appreciate you taking the time, Michael. Pleasure. I know you've got a day job, right? I do. Jackie. So I know we, we don't have real big day jobs. We both have day So we're all doing this stuff. But, but to take that time, and it really is a legacy. It's it really is. a legacy to, to see that hospital continue. No question. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for watching. We'll look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Hudson. Thank you. All right.